Kowloon, Hong Kong, a vibrant urban crush of retail and business life. The Garley Building, late afternoon. The workday is winding down. A worker notices a small fire on the second floor and calls the fire department. One minute later, the fire department gets a second emergency call. Firefighters arrive, expecting to see a small fire on the second floor. But within minutes, the top three floors of the Garley building are an inferno of smoke and flame. The fire takes hold on the lower floors, but above, out of reach of rescuers. Survivors are in a desperate struggle for their lives. The fire takes 20 hours to extinguish and claims 40 lives. It is the deadliest fire in Hong Kong's modern history. When the fire is extinguished, the upper and lower floors are devastated, but the middle floors are almost untouched. It's a fire disaster like no other. Did two fires start simultaneously, or are they somehow connected? And what could have triggered this terrible blaze? November 20th, 1996, in Kowloon, Hong Kong, one of the most densely populated areas in the world. A maze of shops, old office buildings, small factories, and crowded apartments, all tightly squeezed together on the edge of the Hong Kong Harbor. The Garley Building is a colorful mix of professional businesses and clinics, a magazine publisher, a music producer, a jewelry design company, doctors and dentist offices. And on the lower floors, a Chinese government-owned arts and crafts department store. At 4.47 on the afternoon of November 20th, emergency receives a call. A small fire is burning on the second floor outside the China Arts and Crafts store. Within five minutes, there are four fire trucks, one ambulance, and 22 firefighters on the scene. Officer in charge Ho Kak Hui finds some wooden objects burning in the lift area. It shouldn't be a big problem. Ho Kak Hui checks out the department store. But there is no sign of either smoke or fire. When he first arrived, Officer Ho had noticed some light smoke at the top of the building. So he goes to check out the upper floors. As he climbs the stairs, he begins to smell smoke. Then, at the eighth floor, he's driven back by a wave of heat and smoke that seems to be billowing down from above. Perplexed, Ho Kak Hui calls in to upgrade the emergency response to a three-alarm fire. On the 10th floor of the Garley building, music producer Joseph Ip hears about the fire downstairs and checks out the security cam on his office TV. He can see smoke pouring out into the lobby. At that time, I thought it wasn't too bad, but I urged people to leave the office because I saw a big cloud of smoke from the CCTV in our office. Joseph Ip and others head for the stairs and down towards street level. At first, the stairwell is smoky, but as they descend, the air quickly clears. Some people even said, okay, it's nothing, let's go back to the office. But I insisted, it could be serious, let's go down. Up on the 11th floor, magazine publisher Edward Lau also hears the news about the fire. Edward Lau and his co-workers enter the back stairwell. They decide to go up for a smoke break on the roof. But as they climb, the stairwell air is getting worse. It was so dark, even though we stuck out our hand, we can't see our fingers. 
As they go up, they meet others who are heading down. People told us it's the third floor on fire. So we told them, let's go up to the rooftop, don't go down. In the Chinese arts and crafts store, a voice over the loudspeaker asked shoppers and sales staff to vacate the store. Workers diligently punch the clock as they leave, never doubting whether they'll be back on the job the next morning. Hoka Kui upgrades the situation to a three-alarm fire. Help is on the way. Back on the second floor, the fire begins to spread sideways through a wall of shutters into the department store. And fire has also taken hold on the first floor below. Edward Lau and his co-workers stumble out breathless onto the Garley roof. So three of us were up in the rooftop with nothing really we can do. We can do nothing. So we start smoking and we thought the fire should be over very soon. But this fire is only just getting started. Hong Kong firefighters were called to a small one-alarm fire on the lower floors of the Garley building. Everything's under control until officer in charge Ho Ka Kui checks out the upper floors. But he's pushed back by a wall of smoke and heat. He's not sure what's going on, but he knows he'd better raise the alarm. The time is 4.55. Fire Chief Aaron Chun is responsible for all three alarm fires in the Kowloon district of Hong Kong. Precious minutes pass as he fights his way through the late afternoon traffic. En route, Ho Ka Kui gives him a report. The heat and smoke have already pushed them down. The maximum uh, height they can reach is to the eighth floor. And something terrible is unfolding on the upper floors of the Garley building. Just minutes earlier, in a dentist's office on the 14th floor, the time, 447. Dr. Kenny Lung's dental assistant alerts him to the smell of smoke. I can smell smoke in the, uh, on the corridor, but I can see at the end of the corridor, which is a lift, the corner at, at the lift lobby, some heavy dark smoke on that area. Dr. Lung sees no cause for alarm. There's been ongoing maintenance work to replace elevators in the Garley building, and the welding has often created light smoke. But he begins to realize that this looks worse than welding smoke. Dr. Lung's assistant calls 911. It's 448, one minute after the first call. The fire department assumes it's the same fire. On the 15th floor, in the offices of the Chow Sang Sang Jewelers, Josephine Pang, a systems manager, has heard about the fire, but it's 12 floors below and she isn't too concerned. Down the hall in a doctor's waiting room, 15-year-old Lee Su Kei waits for a school friend and wonders what's going on. One floor down, Dr. Lung decides they should leave the building. I was telling myself, remember to turn off the computer and lock the door. But by now, the hallway had filled with thick smoke. Within one minute, the, the whole situation changed. So I forgot to turn off the computer, I forgot to lock the door, I just went out. But when I left the office, the whole corridor was full of smoke. I can't smell, I can't breathe without covering my nose and my mouth with a wet towel. Dr. Lung and others head for the back stairs. Heading down, they pass Edward Lau and two others running up to the roof. After maybe two stories down, uh, the smoke become less and less, and three or four stories down, there was basically no smoke, no more smoke. Yeah. Only a couple of minutes have passed, but when Josephine and her colleagues decide to leave, the hallway outside the office is impassable with smoke. They are trapped 15 floors above the street. 
that can hear fire engine sirens arrive. It's 4.52. One of her windows opens out onto the roof of another building, four floors down. The plan, to tie their pants together and to lower themselves as far as they can, then jump. One by one, the men lower themselves out the window. Josephine, who has insisted on going last, can't wait much longer. Down the hall, Lee Su Kei and his school friend are backed against the windows of the doctor's surgery. The air is thick with smoke. They can no longer see. They can no longer breathe. It's taken Aaron Chung only five to six minutes to arrive on the scene. When he looks up, he's shocked. I could see that um, smoke is billing from the top three floors of the Gary building. Fire Chief Aaron Chung has seen enough. He calls in an order to upgrade the emergency. He's got a five-alarm fire on his hands. Because I know it would be a very difficult job. We need more uh, manpower, more ladders uh, to carry out the rescue. The air on the roof is getting so thick with smoke that Edward can barely breathe. He and his co-workers realize that they too are trapped. From Nathan Road below, onlookers feel helpless and horrified. One floor down, Lee Su Kei fights for his life, climbing out onto the windowsill 15 floors above Pilkham Street. Down the hall, many of Josephine's co-workers have gathered with growing panic and are running to the windows for air. But the open windows are a cruel last gasp. The offices explode in flames. With an inferno at her back, Josephine can wait no longer and drops four floors onto the roof below. She has serious cuts and bruises and has broken both legs, but she's alive. His schoolmate and five others are dead. In a desperate attempt to stay alive, 15-year-old Lee Su Kei clings to an air conditioner on the outside of a 15th-story window until he can hold on no longer. Everybody was, was screaming, don't jump, don't jump, and he, he jumped because actually there was already fire burning at his back. He, I, I don't think he, he has any choice. The boy lands on a second-floor awning. He didn't move a bit at all, and everybody thought he's dead. But uh, we, we saw him move again, a slight movements. On the streets below, all eyes are drawn 15 floors upward. What was billowing smoke is now flame. Come on. And on the 15th floor, a huge fireball spewed from a window, and I was really, really shocked. And I thought, oh my God, it's so serious. The fire was so serious. People on the 13th floor use the chairs to, to just break the glass. Then we see smoke coming out, heavy smoke and fire coming out from the window. Chung calls for rescue ladders. There's no other way to reach those desperate and dying on the upper floors. And he calls for helicopters. The rooftop is covered in smoke but people may be trapped up there. For Edward and three others on the roof, time is running out. The smoke was getting very dense, and the floor was getting hot. And the most terrifying scene is that we listened to many people calling for help underneath us, and the reporters from the other buildings, they're yelling, help them, help them. The mayhem is overwhelming, but the fire's rapid spread is what shocks the veteran firefighter. Firefighters on rescue ladders pluck those whom they can reach from the 12th and 13th floors, many only minutes from sure death. At that moment, what I was thinking is that how I could rescue those people, but not to imagine how the fire could develop so rapidly. The most important thing is that how can I rescue those people?
and in less than 10 minutes, all the yelling stopped. Still trapped on the roof, Edward Lau and three co-workers are now in a desperate situation. We start seeing the fire coming up, spilling up to us from the top floor. And now we've got very limited space to stand, and fire was all around us, and we did not dare to look down. As flames close in, one of the Black Hawk helicopters hovers precariously over the Garley roof, dodging electric wires, cables, and billboards. They can barely see for smoke. But a man drops over the edge, hanging by a winch line. Twice, the helicopter pilot tries to bring him close to the trapped men. On the third try, he succeeds. And one by one, Edward Lau and his three colleagues are saved. In all, firefighters rescue over 70 trapped office workers. No one knows how many have succumbed to a horrifying death in the upper floors, but they fear the worst. This was something unthinkable, according to my experience. At that time, I got, I think I've been in the service for over 25 years. There's something unseen before. The other floors in between, they were basically intact. So there's something very really strange. Hong Kong Fire Chief Joe Kwok arrives at the scene at 6 p.m. and is shocked by what looked like two separate fires. Firefighters work through the night, struggling to bring the blaze under control. But it will take them 20 hours, and they will lose one of their own in the process. One firefighter dies when he falls, blinded by smoke, into an open elevator shaft. Survivors like Joseph Ip watch news reports for hours. Got something old. I was so sad, and I cried, and I couldn't sleep that night. Fire Chief Joe Kwok, who assumes command of the battle throughout the night, is tormented by questions. I was not happy, you know. In fact, I, uh, before the fire, I just did not believe such a tragedy fire could have happened in Hong Kong. No one knows how many lives have been lost or why, but by morning, the search for answers will begin. The Garley building fire is barely out, the bodies inside not yet recovered, but the people of Hong Kong need answers. How could this happen? And why did so many people die? Fire investigators have a baffling mystery on their hands. Damage is concentrated on the top three floors, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, and the bottom two floors. It's very strange, because normally fire will only burn uh, on the top floor or lower floors. But it, at this time, the fire is burning at both ends, the top and the bottom. So job one is to figure out if they were fighting two separate fires or if in fact it was one single fire that somehow jumped 11 floors. To unravel this mystery, they have to go back to the beginning, to the very first emergency calls. The first call came at 447 from a worker who noticed a small fire in the lift landing area on the second floor of the building. One minute later, there was a second call. It was Dr. Lung's dental assistant. She said there was smoke on the 14th floor. Within minutes, the top three floors of the building were engulfed in flame. How could the flames have traveled so far, so fast? The speed of the fire suggests that two fires were set nearly simultaneously, a strong indicator of arson. If individuals were involved, who were they? There were hundreds of people who had been in the building prior to the fire. And uh, we have actually uh, interviewed over 680 civilian witnesses. Interviews do not reveal any leads, any kind of suspicious behavior, or suspects who would have a strong enough motive to commit such a terrible crime. But if it wasn't arson, how could the fire have struck in two places at once? 
The next step in the investigation is to establish the point of origin or seat of the fire. But this question is problematic as well. Dougal Drysdale, fire investigator. There are many markers uh, that you look for to try to identify where a fire started. The most common one is where the damage is at a low point. The lowest point is often considered to be the point at which it started because the fire tends to move upwards. The other marker that many people look for is the point of maximum damage. If the fire started there, it probably burnt for longest there, and therefore you would have most damage. But the picture painted by the scene doesn't help. On the upper floors, the damage was worse on the 15th floor than it was on the 13th and 14th. And on the lower floors, the damage was worse on the second floor than it was on the first. Not only does the Garley fire appear to be two separate fires, but both fires appear to have spread downward. Fire investigators are stumped. But at the same time, another team is performing a far grislier task, one that will lead the investigation in a whole new direction. A specially trained team, the Disaster Victim Identification Unit, is working the Garley Building's top three floors. Their task is to recover human remains and any evidence that might help with identification, and to document exactly where each body lies. Team leader, Nigel Williams. My team first went into a, a doctor's surgery, uh, which was on the, the rear of the building on the 15th floor. There was uh, almost no furniture left. Um, there, there was no bodies in that, that first large room. Next, Nigel Williams enters what appears to have been the doctor's surgery room. It was obvious that uh, the people there had, had seen what was going on or realized what was happening to them, and they'd all gone into that, that final room, which was closest to the window at the rear of the building. Here, Nigel finds the first six victims. There was very little left of, of the victims on that side of the room. And there was two or three bodies closest to the window, which were much more recognizable. I later learned and, and saw pictures on the television of, uh, of a teenage boy who, who jumped out from the, from the window um, of that surgery. Across the hall in a large open space is where Nigel Williams finds the remains of 22 victims, most of them in the accounting department of Chow Sang Sang Jewelers. There was a number of bodies that were found piled up on top of each other uh, in certain areas of the room, up against the windows or in corners of, uh, of the, the walls. Um, it would, that obviously made it difficult to, to identify and, and separate each, each part. Nigel Williams' unit recovers 39 victims, some reduced to ash, others entangled skeletons, all on the 15th, 14th, and 13th floors. The final death toll of the Garley fire, including one firefighter, is 40. But a definite pattern emerges from the position of the bodies. It's clear from the degree of burning and the location of the deceased that smoke, heat, and fire entered each office from the central hallway. And those closest to the north end of the building, where the hallway opened onto the elevators, died the fastest. The focus of the investigation narrows on the elevators. On the day of the fire, Welders and machinists were working on a major retrofit. Did workers inside the elevator shaft have anything to do with the origins of this terrible fire? <music> Investigators have determined that the fire that killed 39 people in the upper floors of the Garley building spread outwards from the elevator shaft. But two vital questions remain. What was the point of origin and how did it spread to the upper floors with such terrifying speed? The Hong Kong government decides to set up a special independent commission to investigate not only the cause of the fire, but the reason for the high fatality rate. The investigation was led by Justice Wu Kwok Ping. At the time of the fire, they were replacing the lifts. There were four lifts in the building. They were replacing uh, all the lifts in the building. They established that the first witness to the fire, minutes before the first emergency call, is a welder named Ing Kwan On. 
He saw a light flickering from the second floor lift opening above him and climbed up the bamboo scaffolding. There in the lift lobby, inside the hoarding that surrounded the lift, was a fire already burning six feet high. Investigators excavate the area around the lift landing on the second floor, and they find traces of a number of combustibles, including corrugated paper. This is clearly the point of origin of the fire. That leads investigators to consider another common cause of ignition, a careless cigarette. Smoking in the building was only allowed in designated areas, but a welder admits to smoking on the job. Could a welder's cigarette have sparked this fire? Or is it possible that the first spark was from welding itself? Investigators take a deeper look at exactly what was happening in the elevator shafts in the weeks before the fire. It was a big job involving machinists, scaffolders, and welders. The Garley building had four lifts, three that spanned the full height of the building and one that served the first three floors. All four were to be replaced, and the work had already been going on for several months. The company hired to do the work was the Ryoden Lift and Escalator Company. At the time of the Garley fire, only lift number two was working. It served the whole building. Lift four only served the Chinese arts and crafts levels. It had been replaced, but wasn't yet working. Lift shafts one and three were completely empty, except for bamboo scaffolding. Standard practice in Hong Kong for its strength, lightness, and ease of installation. The scaffolding ran the full length of lift shaft number three, from the basement to the 15th floor. Scaffolders were still completing work on lift shaft number one. They'd gone as high as the 11th floor. For safety, plywood hoardings had been erected in a space around the lift openings, with padlocked doors to keep office workers from getting too close to the open shafts. The day of the fire, the doors on the hoardings were open to let light into the shaft for scaffolders to work. It was within one of these hoardings on the second floor that fire was first spotted. Uh, workers kept a lot of combustible, com combustible materials in, inside this hoarding, uh, either plywood or um, bamboos for the scaffolding, uh, planks and carpet paper, used newspapers, every sort of thing, and sawdust maybe. Oh, very combustible materials were there. Welding was a big part of the process of replacing the lifts. And the contractor in charge had even placed signs in lift lobbies in the Garley building. The sign apologizes for the black smoke and foul smell caused by the welding and adds, please do not be alarmed. At the time of the fire, there were two workers inside the third lift shaft. A welder on the 11th floor and the welder who first reported the fire on the first floor. All eyes are now on the welding that was taking place on the 11th floor. Could welding sparks, or perhaps a tossed cigarette butt, have started a fire 10 floors below? But investigators have to answer a critical question. Could something really drop 10 floors down a shaft, somehow land outside the shaft on the landing, several feet from the lift opening and still be hot enough to ignite a fire. George Green is a consultant from Safety Accident and Failure Limited. He runs a series of tests. Initially, all the sparks go straight down into the shaft pit. But maybe they bounced off a scaffolding cross piece and bounced out of the lift shaft. He sets up a line of bamboo poles to deflect the sparks onto a tray lined with paper. It works, but the sparks fail to ignite the test paper. Neither welding sparks nor cigarette butts retain enough heat after a 10-floor fall. They burn out before they can ignite anything. If welding sparks won't ignite paper, what will? Investigators take a closer look at what the welders were actually doing inside the lift shafts, and they discover something critical to their investigation. From welding, there were several kinds of things which, which were spread. One is the sparks from the welding. The other is molten droplets from the joint metal. And the other is the cut metal. 
They aren't supposed to do it. But what if welders were using their equipment to cut metal and not only to join the metal? In which case, larger burning pieces of metal might fall through the shaft. And the metal which was cut would fall down the lift shaft. And that piece of metal would be red, would be nearly molten, it's red hot. A closer inspection of some of the welding that had been done inside the shafts, and investigators find clear evidence of metal cut with a welding machine. Perhaps due to the awkwardness of working inside the shaft, the welding is sloppy. Finally, a welding machine that was found on the 11th floor after the fire was at the highest setting, too high for normal welding. George Green does further tests. So they were larger particles, retain more heat, and the effect of the cutting on the combustibles in the tray resulted very quickly in a fire starting. Investigators reach a consensus. Cut metal from welding is the most likely cause of the fire. This is quite feasible, I think. In the uh, lift shaft itself, you had bamboo scaffolding. So any object that has dropped down the lift shaft could quite easily hit one of the bamboo poles, the horizontal poles, and bounce out onto the lift landing. It's a chance event, but it certainly cannot be discounted. Investigators think they know where and how the Garley fire started, and they point the finger at the welders. But nothing about the origins of the fire can account for what happened next. It's the way the fire behaves that leads to the, uh, the loss of life and the way that people are trapped in the building. So it concerned me that uh, so much emphasis was put on trying to identify just the source of ignition. The fire started in the lift lobby on the second floor and somehow jumped to the top floors in a deadly mixture of toxic gas, smoke, and fire. That's where the majority of the fire's victims were killed. And that's the mystery that remains unsolved. To account for the burning at high and low level, there had to be some means by which the fire had spread up an open shaft of some kind. It could have been a stairwell, but in this case, it was clear that uh, the lift shafts were involved. But what could have fueled the fire spread up the lift shafts? Lifts two and four both had intact elevator cars that would have blocked or greatly slowed the fire spread. But shafts one and three were open to the upper floors. And inside the open shafts, bamboo scaffolding. Investigators discover that bamboo has a curious property when it burns. We came across a couple of paragraphs about it in a book on uh, building construction in the Far East which had a chapter on bamboo. Once bamboo starts burning, the air trapped in the uh, poles expands and causes the bamboo to shatter, spreading burning fragments of bamboo uh, over quite a wide distance. But investigators quickly determine that there is not enough fuel in the bamboo structure to carry the fire to the top floors. And even if there was, the scaffolding is secured with plastic ties, which would melt quickly, causing the structure to collapse. So if the fire spread up the elevator shafts and there wasn't sufficient fuel to account for it, what else could have caused the inferno that engulfed the top floors of the Garley building? Maybe it was something in the structure of the building itself. Once we started investigating the state of the building before the fire, it became apparent that uh, many things were wrong about the building, and that led to the high casualty rate. Architects plan for the possibility of fire in the design of every structure. They do this in two ways, using sealed, self-closing fire doors to cut off airflow to stairs and hallways, localizing any fires that start, and using fire-resistant materials in doors and walls that take 30 minutes to burn through, giving people time to escape. It's clear that in the Garley Building fire, these measures failed on both counts. Hong Kong's head building inspector, Hui C. Y. We carry uh, with us the old plans, the old approved building plans. So whatever is different from the uh, old building plans, we could consider it as later conversions or alterations. 
The most obvious alterations had been made by the Chinese Arts and Crafts Store. Fire-resisting barriers had been removed between the lift lobbies on the first and second floor and Chinese Arts and Crafts to facilitate the movement of customers in and out of the store. In their place, shutters were installed, which burned quickly, exposing the fire to the large open department store full of combustible goods. The department store provided an enormous reserve of fuel that kept the fire burning all night long. This was the first in a deadly chain of events that led to disaster. Also, what is called Stair A, which served the first three floors of the building, had been closed off at the ground floor and the third floor level and turned into a series of storerooms. This storage area was filled with combustibles. Ironically, in the original design, this staircase was meant to be the firefighter's staircase. If open, it would have given firefighters an alternate access to the seat of the fire on the second floor. So you had a situation where uh, we had enlarged the area where a fire could actually occur, but also by closing the stair, you prevented easy access of the fire service to uh, the seat of the fire on the second floor lift landing. Now the stage was set for a fire to rage in the lower floors, fed by airflow from the removed fire doors. But on the floors above, workers had done something that compounded the problem. In shafts one and three, all of the elevator doors had been removed to allow light in for workers. The way the fire developed uh, created uh, really two chimneys. The uh, two lift shafts were open top to bottom and air was being drawn in at the bottom and the hot gases and flames pushed out of the top in a very vigorous manner. And this meant that there would be a really uh, thick, smoky, toxic brew of gases that would be reaching the people on the top floors. And these hot gases would have reached the upper level in under a minute, well under a minute. Once the burning gases, fire and smoke reached the upper floors, a difficult fire was transformed into a very dangerous fire. Still, loss of life should have been minimal. But there were also serious problems on the upper floors. The plan for every floor of the Garley building was simple. A central hall with three offices on either side, a lift lobby with a stairwell on the north side and a stairwell on the south side. Both should have been separated from the hallway by self-closing fire-resistant doors. But eyewitnesses confirmed that the fire doors on both sides of the central hallway were open on each of the three upper floors. This opened up the airflow and allowed the heat and toxic fumes to roar down the hallways into the office areas. And once that happened, the people on the upper level uh, had to make a decision very quickly as to whether to escape or to stay in place and hope to be rescued. Even so, occupants should still have had a chance to survive simply by staying inside their offices behind flame-resistant doors. But the building inspection revealed further deadly alterations. Most of the wooden doors separating offices from the hallways had been replaced with glass that shattered very quickly from the heat in the hallways. This allowed the fire and burning gases into the offices and it set the stage for the last in this deadly chain of events. The burning heat and gases that had accumulated throughout the top floors were unbearable. And in their desperation for air, office workers threw open windows. Fresh air was sucked in and fed the fire to the point of flashover, an all-enveloping spontaneous inferno. In some parts of the top floors, judging from the damage caused to the, uh, to the glass, to the metal, and to change in color in some of the concrete, we believe the uh, temperature has reached as high as 800 degrees in, uh, locally. It was this final murderous flashover that killed many of the Garley Fire's victims, including 22 workers in Josephine Pang's office. Dougal Drysdale demonstrates the chimney effect. We have uh, still quite a small fire, but as the fire grows in size, uh, we start to build up a layer of hot combustion products under the ceiling, uh, which begin to radiate back down to the surface of the fire, 
and increase the level of burning. So what starts off as a small fire, as it grows, it will begin to accelerate because of the accumulation of heat within the compartment. At the moment, the fire would be considered to be not particularly threatening, but as it develops towards the flashover stage, it becomes a very different story. And in the Garley fire, that flashover stage happened faster than any of the fire investigation experts had ever seen before. The horrifying speed meant that even one minute of hesitation by either the victims or the rescuers meant certain death. Seconds made the difference. But investigators asked themselves, why did so many of the victims hesitate? The bizarre and deadly Garley building fire spread with a speed that left veteran firefighters stunned and 40 people dead. The final and most painful question for investigators, could they not have saved more? Fire investigators find several distinct reasons why so many people died, but the most immediate factor was reaction time. Their fate was determined by as little as two or three minutes of hesitation. But why? For several months before the fire, Welders and machinists worked daily on the major renovation of the building's lifts. The burning smell of the welding was pervasive. But the building had smoke alarms. Did they malfunction or did people simply ignore them? They sounded, but the noise they created, the sound they created was smothered because they were covered with plastic bags. It turns out that employees of the Chinese arts and crafts store put plastic bags over the smoke detectors. They were regularly being triggered by smoke and dust from the work taking place in the lift shafts. People in the building got used to the smell and smoke. Sometimes, whenever they went back to the building, to the offices and so on, they saw smoke in the lift lobby. Smoke is one of the most obvious warning signs of fire and people in the Garley building learned to ignore it. On the eventful day, they, they also saw, some of them saw smoke, but they thought it was smoke from the welding. And uh, some people were very serious about it, and they escaped, of course. But some people thought, oh, it was, as usual, smell and smoke. Interviews with the rescued also revealed that they'd never had a fire drill. Many were unfamiliar with the back stairs, and were reluctant to brave the heat and smoke of the hallways. Backing further into their offices cost them their lives. Because fire spread so quickly on the lower floors, firefighters couldn't reach the people trapped on the upper floors by going up through the building. Both main staircases were quickly impassable. In the early stages, access to a short third staircase on the lower floors, now converted into a storage room, might have made a difference for firefighters they would have reached the seat of the fire at a stage when it was relatively easy to control. With the only means of rescue being from windows, rescue ladders saved dozens of lives, but they weren't as effective at the back on Pilcom Street because they couldn't get close enough to the upper floors. The roof extension at the back of the Garley building that broke Lee Suke's fall keeps the ladders from reaching the top floors. And while the Black Hawk helicopter pilots thought they could pluck some people from office windows, they created so much downdraft, they made the fire worse and had to leave. But the root cause of the disaster? Properly closed smoke doors in all stairwells and lift lobbies would have provided everyone with as much as 30 minutes during which to escape to an unlikely safe haven, Garley's middle floors. Instead, death came quickly. The official cause of death for 39 office workers was smoke inhalation, but Professor Drysdale doubts that. The rate of development was so rapid and the flames reached the top floor so quickly, it's uh, quite likely that many of them uh, died due to heat and uh, flame, a very unpleasant death. But on this tragic day, there were also incredible survival stories. Josephine Pang and her colleagues came through their leap for survival with bruises and minor fractures. And Lucy C.K., who suffered broken vertebrae in his terrifying 10-story fall, he went through months of physiotherapy and made a complete recovery. 
The Garley Fire was a watershed disaster. It led to changes in Hong Kong fire codes that have radically improved the city's current fire safety records. With all these improvements, we are able to uh, reduce the, uh, the, the death toll, I mean, from fire uh, to a uh, single digit. Last year, only we caught uh, nine deaths in the fire, which I think is an amazing record um, as far as Hong Kong is concerned, or such a densely populated city is concerned. Dr. Lung still recalls with gratitude that he'd had a break from seeing patients that afternoon. Preoccupation with a complex bit of dentistry could have cost him two extra minutes and his life. The fire has taken away everything from me, but I still uh, praise the Lord because I'm still alive. So after the fire, I, I treasure uh, life more. Each day you think, Wow, it's great working in the music business. I love music. I really enjoy creating music for people to hear. Then out of the blue, there's a fire. And just like that, it's all gone. Those of us who escaped from the roof all feel incredibly sad. We never thought a fire could be so deadly. Now when we see each other, we never talk about what happened. 